Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday, the middle of the week. Uh, my name is Gary Barnes, um, and I have Brenda Allen uh, in the background helping me with um, with the technical aspects of this webinar. All of you are muted, uh, and so you can communicate via texting um, through the uh, GoToWebinar application as you want to. Um, I'm really excited about this presentation because uh, I do a lot of work with couples and um, and I love it um, because what could be more rewarding than helping couples uh, try to stay together and and work on their on their issues so um, uh, I hope that all of you get a few things out of today's presentation and uh, you'll notice at the end I have some resources for you to to follow up and get more information. So it is 12. Uh, I'm going to just wait one more minute. We're expecting quite a few more people to enter in. Um, please let Brenda know or let us know if you're having trouble hearing. Um, we have occasionally had problems with the audio and we may or may not be able to correct it if we're having problems but we sure would like to know so let us know we did test it today so we've done our due diligence uh, on it um, okay I'm gonna go ahead and get started now uh, the way I do these is uh, these webinar thingies <laughs> these lunch webinars is uh, we will go till about 10 to 1 and at that point entertain questions that you may have and try to answer as many as we can before we run out of time. Um, I understand that some of you probably will be arriving late um, because of your lunch hour and may have to leave early because of your lunch hour uh, but you'll have the handouts um, which should help you some and we're happy to try to answer questions later on um, if you have any. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, you can see this very happy couple. They have obviously, they're obviously just leaving my office um, and enjoying themselves. Okay, these are our uh, couples. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so today's objectives are to understand the research about the keys to healthy, successful, long-term relationships. It's an exciting time to be in my field. I've been in, the, in this field of mental health and have been seeing couples for, I am not kidding, 30 years. Um, and things have very much changed in terms of uh, how we view uh, communication with couples. Um, and the keys to successful long-term relationships. There's been some powerhouse research going on um, and new theories that have really helped us and really improved my work, I know. So we're gonna talk about that research and the keys as we now understand them to a healthy, successful long-term relationship. We're gonna talk about adult attachment theory, which sounds really exciting, I'm sure, but I'm gonna tell you why you should care a lot about it. And then we're going to talk about how to have more successful communication and effective conflict management in your relationship. And uh, if you haven't attended a webinar, uh, this is just me talking. So it's very content rich. You don't really get, you know, 10 minutes to stop and practice something. You just got to keep, we just keep clipping along and then any practice you do or digestion of the material probably will happen uh, after the hour. Okay, so the first guy to talk about, first person to talk about is a giant in our field. His name is John Gottman. He was rated by uh, mental health therapists as one of the 10 most influential therapists of the 20th century. So uh, that included Freud and um, uh, Carl Jung and Carl Rogers and all the people you learned about, those of you who took Psychology 101. 
Some of you may have heard of John Gottman, but those of you who haven't, um, he has done pioneering research on couples by setting up a scientifically based approach. Basically, they have people come into their laboratory at the University of Washington in Seattle, and they run them through a series of tests uh, um, by having them sit together and they measure their heart rate. They take urine samples uh, to, to test uh, for stress levels. Uh, they have what's called a, giggle, a jiggleometer to measure how much they're shifting in their chair. And then he's trained his research assistants, probably unpaid graduate students, to um, look at videos of people's faces and watch what happens to their faces using some research about facial muscles and that kind of thing. So it's really pretty cool. I won't go into any more details since we don't have a lot of time. But over, so they have them come into the lab, they collect all this research, then they invite some couples to stay in a condo for a weekend. And so they try to create a natural environment and the couples agree to be um, uh, video or uh, audioed or videoed, I'm not sure, something like that. And their urine is collected while they're there for the weekend. Um, and uh, so they gather all this data and then they follow the couples. Uh, every year they, they follow up with the couple and see how they're doing. So based on the criteria that he's developed, he can predict divorce, uh, he can predict whether a couple will be together in five years um, over 90% of the time with over 90% accuracy. And uh, that's if they don't get help. If they don't get help, he can predict. So we should pay attention to his predictors of divorce as well as his predictors of success. Um, the other interesting thing about John Gottman is he wrote, uh, a couple's guide to communication, which was sort of the Bible for mar for a lot of us marriage therapists in the 80s and 90s, which talked about the speaker listener technique and you know um, some ways and I messages and really training couples in how to talk to each other, which is somewhat helpful, but turns out to not be the most important information that you need to have. So let's go on. So when I see couples, I usually get out the issue of perpetual issues as quickly as I can. Um, when you choose the person you're going to spend your life with, you're also choosing a set of issues that you'll have for your entire relationship. Um, and those are called perpetual issues. And this is in all relationships, um, not just unhappy relationships. So you could be perfectly happy um, and healthy in your relationship, but you could still probably name things about your partner that drive you crazy or that, or that maybe did drive you crazy, but bother you to some degree or another. Uh, there are just fundamental differences because we all have differences. We come from different backgrounds. We have different temperaments. Uh, we have different um, ways of viewing the world. And so we, and some of those are very set and are probably not going to change a great deal. And we think that two thirds of the things that we fight about in relationships are literally unresolvable perpetual issues. That doesn't mean you can't make movement on them. It just means that the fundamental difference between you is probably not going to change. So accepting that and understanding that is very important because it helps you, first of all, hopefully it helps you say, oh, okay, so if I leave this relationship and you know get into a new relationship, I'm also going to have issues in that relationship. So there's no you know, um, illusion that you could be in a relationship where everything is peachy keen all of the time and you see things exactly the same way. That doesn't mean that, um, that you should necessarily stay in every relationship you're in because not all perpetual issues are, uh, are equal. There may be perpetual issues that are so big and upsetting that they really make you not compatible. But for the most part, people, 
have a tendency to panic and think that because we have these differences, maybe we shouldn't be together. And that seems to absolutely not be true. So another thing that Gottman talks about is, and this is a predictor of divorce, he calls these the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, don't panic because we all do these sometimes. And we can even go through periods of weeks or months where we do these as a couple. Um, and it's not, necess it's not necessarily a predictor of divorce. But if these are, are central to the way you function as a couple and have been for some time and you're not taking action to correct it, then this will lead to a basic mistrust, uh, a turning away from each other, and you know the ultimate erosion of your relationship. So the first one is criticism, um, which we differentiate from complaining because complaining is um, I'm unhappy uh, that you leave your clothes on the floor in the bedroom is a complaint, but a criticism would be why do you always leave your crap all around the house? You know, I pick my stuff up. Why do you, you know, leave yours? So, so, so you're you're questioning. You're sort of uh, cajoling your partner in that way, creating extra negativity and globalizing it. And the second horseman, not surprisingly, is defensiveness, which closely follows criticism. Um, and this is a perhaps the most common pattern or dance that couples do uh, of criticism and defensiveness. One person criticizes, the other person gets defensive, which leads often to more criticism because and turning up the volume because if your partner is being defensive, obviously that means they're not hearing you. So you should just turn up the volume and everything will be better. But that tends to lead to more defensiveness. Contempt is the third of these four horsemen, which is when you're, you know, just mean, when you call your partner names or uh, imply that they're not very intelligent, um, things like that. Uh, this is sometimes done intentionally. Sometimes it's done unintentionally in the heat of battle um, when you're sort of battling and pulling weapons out to use against each other. And then stonewalling uh, is when people get so um, emotionally flooded that they withdraw from the relationship. They may hang their head down. They may ignore the other person, um, pretend they're not there. So they can uh, remove themselves emotionally or, and or physically, uh, refusing to answer or look at you, um, that kind of thing. And I'm going to show you in a couple of slides. That's not the same as walking away from a conflict to take a time out, which actually I think is a positive step in many cases. Okay, so um, not to leave you with negativity, um, there are antidotes for each one of these. So for criticism, um, the alternative is complaining, as I said earlier, or uh, an even better alternative would be um, trying to restate the criticism in a, in a positive way. Let me give you an example. Um, you feel like uh, your partner is working too much and not spending enough time with you. So they come home after a long day of work and you, uh, in the criticism box, you assault them by saying, why are you always working so much? You never want to spend time with me um, and, uh, you never want to you never want to do anything with me. I need some attention from you. Uh, could be changed into saying something like, um, "You remember that time last weekend when we were sitting on the couch in front of the fire cuddling? I want to do that again. I want to do more of that." So you can imagine between those two messages, which one your partners likely to respond more positively to. And getting that time on the couch cuddling is probably more likely to happen with the, with the second option. OK, uh, with contempt, the antidote is um, appreciation, which we'll talk about more. For defensiveness, uh, owning some part of the problem. So your partner may be laying a whole heap of stuff on you that you don't necessarily agree with. But you can say, 
you know, I do. Uh, I I am sorry that that I did uh, this one thing. Uh, I'm sorry that I blew up and said this one thing, um, even though the reason and you don't say this, but even though I did that because you were yelling at me at the time. So owning some part of the problem can really uh, be be helpful. And then for stonewalling, because we think stonewalling is mainly a function of being emotionally upset, uh, soothing yourself, uh, calming yourself down uh, seems to be um, uh, the, the way to go. Okay. I'm clipping along here. Positive. So um, now what I'm talking about, what I want to talk to you about now are positive factors in your relationship that will ultimately affect relationship communication. So I said earlier that um, we used to think that if you sit couples down and you say, okay, we want one of you to be the speaker and the other to be the listener and uh, you have specific roles, so uh, one of you gets to speak about what you're upset about and the other one has to listen and paraphrase back what the other person said. Well, I'm, that's a logical and reasonable way to approach communication, but the problem is if you're not doing very well as a couple and you're not feeling very close um, and you haven't done this, what we would call background work or building work in your relationship, that speaker listener thing is just going to fall flat on its face. So what I want you to think about today is how do we make ourselves more resilient as a couple so that when we do have conflict, we can deal with it in a lot more constructive way. And the research bears this out. So here are some ways to do that. Build in more conversations into your uh, into your day-to-day -day life. For example, you might have a stress-reducing conversation at the end of, of your workday. Um, and John Gottman's got a specific way of doing that. You can Google it, stress-reducing conversation. Um, so you might, you and your partner might join together. Um, you could also have what he calls a weekly, he calls it a state of the union um, conversation, which is about an hour and in a, in a an hour long. And in a few minutes, um, I'll show you how you could spend five hours a week. Um, actually, they've turned it into six. Sorry, it used to be five. Six hours a week um, to sort of build this resiliency. So basically, you want to have more time together. And then the emotional bank account idea, which I don't know if this was Gottman's original idea, but probably you, some of you have heard of this because we now use this same concept to talk about relationships with our children, even with our coworkers, um, with students in school I've heard it used. And we think uh, that in relationship, uh, you need a ratio, and I'm talking about long-term committed relationships such as marriage. Um, we think you have to have a five to one ratio of positives to negatives. And so think of positives as deposits to the bank account. And what I tell couples is you have a lot more control over the deposits than you have over the withdrawals. Because you don't come home at night and say, I think I'm going to start a fight with my spouse tonight, right? Um, those just seem to unfortunately happen. But you can say, I'm going to come home tonight. I'm going to spend some extra time talking. I'm going to look for, uh, you know, what, what my partner did uh, that I feel good about today, that kind of thing. Godman uses this term, bids for attention. Um, and these are, uh, and I'll, I can read to you um, from his book. I've got it sitting right here. Um, they can be as simple as, could you get me a beer? Or as profound as, I need you after a scary medical diagnosis. Not all bids are obvious. Many of them get missed, ignored, or misinterpreted. One partner may say, I love you, expecting the other to turn around and initiate a hug, but the partner is distracted and just says, I know you do. So bids for attention are these little things that that we do that connect us. And we talk about them being uh, requested, 
We talk about them being accepted and then rejecting a bid for attention is not like get away from me. It often is just ignoring it, just being distracted, um, you know, not paying enough attention to what the other person's saying. Going to the grocery store is one of my favorite examples. You're sitting on the couch watching a game. Your spouse says, would you like to go? Uh, I'm going grocery shopping. Would you like to come? I'm not saying that all the time you have to say yes, but if you did say yes, you might say you might be sitting on there on the couch and say, you know, I'm really comfortable right now and this game is really exciting and uh, I hate grocery shopping. But if you're intelligent about your relationship, you might say, but it's an opportunity for us to spend time together and it will help me down the road because we'll have uh, fewer arguments and um, we'll be feeling better about each other. So is that you begin to appreciate aspects of them and their uniqueness, you know, so because you're not doing with judgment, you're not saying, well, why does she do that? Or why, why does he do that? That seems silly. Instead, you say, well, that's interesting. He does that or she does that. That's, that's unique. That's unique to her. Um, and that's pretty cool. So um, it's one way that you can use appreciation because to verbalize appreciation, and this may seem obvious after I say it, verbalizing appreciation requires noticing, requires that you notice something to appreciate. So I would encourage you to consider spending more time trying to notice things about your partner that are worthy of appreciation, which hopefully is a lot. Okay, then accepting influence, which uh, in Gottman's world is a male problem more than a female problem. Uh, probably not because of uh, genetics, probably because of our the way that we're socialized differently. Um, but accepting influence is your capacity to sort of flex um, and meet your partner where they are rather than sort of insisting that they meet you where you are. So your partner loves to play softball. You've never even thrown a softball, um, but you might say, well, I'll go to your games and uh, check it out, you know, and maybe uh, you'll offer, you'll start uh, throwing the ball together in the backyard. Um, and maybe you'll come to sort of say, hey, this isn't so bad. Um, or maybe you'll say, well, it's not my favorite thing, but, uh, but you're meeting your partner where they are. Um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, there's a partner who likes to uh, go dancing. And so you, I will see a lot of couples who will start taking dance lessons together. And that's a really positive thing, particularly for if one of the partners is like, you know, I'm really uncomfortable dancing and I really don't want to do this. But because it's important to you, uh, I'll do it. And this is such a great uh, factor accepting influence in helping stabilize your relationship and create a climate of goodwill. As Gottman says, um, if you're watching the, if a guy, because he's talking about guys mostly, if a guy is watching a football game and his wife interrupts him um, because she has something she wants to talk about, he turns the game off or at least the volume down, turns around and says, you know, okay, what is it you wanted to talk about? But if, but because that guy does that, um, his partner probably is going to stop interrupting him during the football game that she knows he loves. So it starts to work in your favor. Gottman calls that the Aikido principle, um, which is yield to win. You give, you give in, and then at the end of the day, you get more back. All right, sliding door moments, which relates to the uh, first slide I showed on positive factors. So this is a Gottman term, sliding door moments. It's when there are opportunities to talk. Um, and so you may open the door or your partner may open the door for you to come in and have a conversation about something. Um, and if you take advantage of those, then uh, you're going to build uh, these connections and the emotional bank account. And if you don't take advantage of that, 
uh, on a regular basis, then it, it leads to more distance and makes you more vulnerable for a destructive kind of conflict. I learned this word this week, so I've been using it as much as I can. I put a dollar in my piggy bank every time I use it, and it's uh, compassionate curiosity. Um, I love that term. Uh, a, a, I, I think you can approach yourself and your partner with a compassionate curiosity about how we are the way we are, why we do what we do. It's sort of the opposite of um, being judgmental of ourselves or of our partners. Okay, and then the magic six hours, which I'm not going to go into a lot. You have a handout that uh, Brenda sent along with uh, this presentation. Um, so the magic six hours uh, are, uh, you could see here, um, how you, they're, they're these small things that you do throughout the week. So how you leave each other, how you uh, reunite in the evening, only two hours a week. Um, uh, practicing some appreciation. His recommendation, Gottman's recommendation, is that you write some things down for this, but it's still only 35 minutes per week. That's five minutes a day. Um, affections, only five minutes a day. Um, and then the State of the Union meeting, which you can read about, and you can also look that up online, too, if, if you'd like to get more detail, or read about it in his book, um, What Makes Love Last, which is uh, in my bibliography at the end. And then a weekly date, that's two of the six hours right there. So it used to be five hours and he added the State of the Union meeting um, to make it a whopping total of six hours a week. Um, so you can, and maybe you don't hit six hours, but uh, you know, look at the, think about the concept of this. All right, so now we're to actual conflict and communication, which I know this, this uh, class is supposed to be about, but everything I just told you are really the most important things about, so now we've got conflict. What are the most important factors there? Well, it turns out the most important uh, factor probably is what we call being emotionally flooded. And I think you all probably know what this is. Uh, I'm sure you've been there a time or two. It's when you're very upset. You're aware of being very upset. You're in the middle of a conflict. We know that your heart rate is, has gone up. Um, we know that you're probably producing uh, the stress hormones, adrenaline, adrenaline and cortisol. Um, your breathing may become more shallow. And what does that start to sound like? It starts to sound like what we call the stress response, right? The fight, flight, freeze that you have when you feel fear. Um, uh, and, and it's a built-in survival thing, well, there's a relationship there, and we'll get to that in a little while. So then calming down becomes the most important thing. So you were thinking I was going to give you a lot of information about how to talk to your partner, and instead, I'm going to tell you, notice when you or your partner are flooded, and then you have to do something to calm down, or you're going to have to take a break, what we would call a timeout. So this leads to repair attempts. And this is, uh, you can imagine Gottman's graduate students in the laboratory, and they're watching couples on video screens, and they see them start to fight, and they see their heart rate go up. And then magically, they see both partners' heart rates start to come down sometimes. Well, they, they, uh, they gave a name to this, they call repair attempts. So let's say you're fighting and, you, and one of the partners says, uh, you're right, you know, uh, or that's a good point. Um, or um, I don't wanna do this, can we start over? Or uh, he, he, uh, Gottman showed one example of a couple, they're both looking down, their heart rates are up, they're fighting. And the guy says, those are nice shoes. <laughs> and his wife says, really, you like them? I didn't pay very much for them. <laughs> and both their heart rates go down. So sometimes I've seen couples use humor. I've seen them make fun of me, uh, literally, in their relationship. So Gary would say, blah, 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 and they make fun of me, and their heart rate comes down, 
um, that way. So we call these repair attempts. So sometimes you can calm yourselves down in a conversation by, uh, and uh, we call these repair attempts because uh, like the one about the shoes was an attempt and then it was accepted by his partner. Uh, soft startups is another concept to teach you about. Um, uh, how a conversation begins is the best predictor of how it ends. So if you storm in on your partner and say, um, um, why the hell did you do this or that or the other thing, um, you're probably going to get a bad response. But if you start a conversation by saying, you know, there's something I want to talk to you about. When would be a good time? Is now okay or is there another time? And um, so kind of starting more softly, preparing the other person for uh, uh, a, a, a more difficult conversation seems to help. And if you can get through three minutes without being flooded, uh, Gottman predicts that there's a 96% chance that your conversation will end well. So that's why that's important. Um, positive sentiment override um, is what's created when um, you're paying a lot of attention to each other and doing all the things that I just said. So sentiment override, uh, and the example I use is if I uh, am supposed to pick my wife up um, and she's standing in the pouring rain um, and it's cold out uh, and I'm 15 minutes late picking her up and she gets in the car and she's angry, understandably, and I make my lame excuse for why I'm late. Um, how we're doing as a couple will be a big determinant about how long that argument lasts, how upset she is, and for how long. So if I've been paying a lot of attention to her, treating her with respect, uh, we have a healthy amount of trust between us, she might get over that in you know five or 10 minutes. Um, if on the other hand, we're not doing well, it's just the latest in a series of, of pieces of evidence that I don't care about her, uh, she might be upset for days and bring this issue up over and over again. Okay, so sentiment override leads to less flooding and a better acceptance of repair. Okay, now timeouts are good, actually. Um, they're an advanced strategy in many cases because if staying and just lobbing weapon, uh, pulling out weapons and lobbing bombs at each other is what you're doing, then stopping doing that may be a much better alternative. So if one or both of you are flooded and being unproductive or hurtful, um, you walking away can be okay. It's best if it's done in a kind and loving and constructive way, but that isn't always uh, possible because you're flooded. I understand that. But you do need to come back to it at some point. Usually it's a minimum of 30 minutes. Um, I'm not going to go into this today because I just simply don't have time. But what you do with that 30 minutes is very important. You can have what we call distress maintaining thoughts. You could say, I'm going to go walk around the block and cool down. And if you go and walk around the block and you're like, I can't believe oh, after all the times I've, and you know, this and this, and she also did this and that, you might come back after walking around the block more upset than you started. So that timeout may not help at all. So you want to find ways to soothe yourself, to put it in context, to think more. Uh, in ways that are more helpful. All right, so I'm not going to go into this because I'm looking at my watch and um, I want to get to the attachment stuff. But uh, Gottman talks, I'll just very quickly go through this. Uh, he has in his in this book, uh, What Makes Love Last, he talks about the Roach Motel, which is sort of the where you check in but you don't check out, the Roach Motel of relationships. And these are the five steps that get you there. So, uh, and all of this should sound familiar to you by now based on everything I've talked about. So you ignore these sliding door moments or the building of the emotional bank account. A regrettable incident occurs and you're um, sort of being nasty to each other. And then this thing called the Zignaric effect uh, means that 
we remember unresolved things. Um, so if you resolve a conflict successfully, um, it doesn't last in your active memory and in your emotional world. But if it's unresolved, it's something you remember, uh, a slight or a, uh, a wrong that your partner did and you haven't talked about it or resolved it, it just lives on. So that's going on. Negative sentiment override takes over and then the four horsemen wreak havoc. And before you know it, as he says, the consequence is the erosion and eventual death of the couple's trust in one another. So if you see any of that happening in your relationship, I would go right back to the beginning. How do we create more sliding door moments and try to rebuild our trust with each other? All right. I'm not going to have time to go into Esther Perel, but she's got a great TED talk where she talks about the difference between love and desire and how you keep desire in a long-term relationship. I threw this slide in because, um, you know, it's related, I think, to conflict in that, um, uh, you know, the, the unrealistic search for too much love, wanting, wanting it all in one relationship uh, can lead to um, dashed expectations. And we know that if your expectations are a little short of what you get, um, you're probably going to be a happier person overall. Um, so I would encourage you to watch your TED Talk. It's great. So let's get in now to adult attachment theory, which is the other big stuff that has happened in our field. Um, so there was, there was in the in the beginning, there was regular attachment theory, which uh, demonstrated that uh, infants um, attach emotionally to their parents. So that might seem like so bizarrely obvious to you now. But in the 40s and 50s and 60s, um, this was not so obvious. We thought that everything was behavioral. If children got fed um, and were warm, that's all that mattered. But it turns out that they want to attach to a secure object, meaning their parents, who are always present when they're in distress and always available to them. And by, and, and by having that, then children thrive. Well, in the, about the 1990s, some clever researchers started thinking, huh, why is it that couples act like children <laughs> when we fight and get so upset when relationships end? And I mean, we just have so much emotion. Um, and so they developed this idea. Well, maybe it's similar to the bond that forms between infants and parents. And by the way, in the old days, we used to talk about people becoming too dependent in relationships. I, I don't talk about that anymore. Now, dependence in a relationship is normal. It's what we do. And we do it sort of out of survival. So we think this is a built-in, evolved survival strategy that attaches adults together so that we'll survive. Um, because two of us, survive better than if we weren't together. Um, so it sort of creates a bond. And, and we even secrete attachment hormones that are built into our system already, oxytocin and vasopressin. So it's pretty cool, huh? Um, so that's why we get so upset when we have what we would call an insecure attachment. Uh, I also didn't mention that attaching allows us to raise children together, which of course um, encourages the survival of our species and, and that's very good for us as well. Um, so you can be securely attached, which means you feel good about your relationship. There isn't a lot of emotional flooding. Or if you're not feeling so sure about your attachment, um, uh, you will um, show uh, emotional distress. And there are two basic styles or reactions to insecure attachment. One is we call anxious and one we call avoidant. Um, anxious people tend to complain, um, get on the other person's case, make a lot of requests, uh, make a lot of contacts, 
um, that kind of thing. Not always, but they tend to. And avoidant people tend to withdraw. So essentially, the basic question is, are you there for me? I, I don't, I, I'm worried that you might not be. And so an anxious person will keep pressing on you. You know, why aren't you giving me this? Why aren't you doing this? You know, I'm worried about this, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and an avoidant person will just withdraw because they'll be like, I'm not sure I can trust you. You know, you're coming at me too fast. I'm worried you're going to engulf me. I'm going to lose my sense of independence. Uh, if you're uh, a Seinfeld fan, um, uh, we call that uh, uh, lose. Lo what was it called? Losing um, independent George. George had that as an avoidant, insecure issue. Um, and interestingly, couples tend to do a dance in relationships where they show opposite styles. And some people are tend to always be anxious and t some people tend to always be avoidant. And sometimes they switch roles in relationship. So Susan Johnson is the powerhouse pioneer in this field. And I mention her because you should look her up and look her popular books up. And I'll mention those at the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, she has an approach that she calls emotion focused therapy. So let me uh, let me read a little bit about what she says. Attachment theory teaches us that our loved one is our shelter in life. When that person is emotionally unavailable or unresponsive, we face being out in the cold, alone and helpless. We are assailed by emotions, anger, sadness, hurt, and above all, fear. This is not so surprising when we remember that fear is our built-in alarm system. It turns on when our survival is threatened. Losing connection with our loved one jeopardizes our sense of security. The alarm goes off in our amygdala or fear central. Um, and she goes on about that. So. Uh, that's why we think people have so much emotion. So emotions exist to help us survive. It's pretty much like the free fight, flee, fight, flight, or freeze reaction that people have. And avoidance might be seen as flight or freeze. And anxious might be viewed more from the fight perspective. All right. Negative emotions then motivate us to protest um, and to realign the connection or attunement as some couples uh, uh, experts uh, call it. So negative emotions are designed to propel us toward uh, resolving the issue. Anxious partners tend to protest by complaining. Avoidant attached partners tend to protest by withdrawing or avoiding. Um, and this can activate that very common criticism and defensiveness cycle. And you can end up talking about everything but what's really going on underneath. So how do we make use of this? Um, remember that emotion is likely to be fundamentally about attachment. Are you there for me? So think of emotion within relationship as being wired into us for survival. It's our friend, really. So we can have a stress response of fight, flight, or freeze. And then you can think about, well, how do I get through a stress response? So it leads naturally to um, needing to calm down, right? To, to uh, uh, So back to Gottman, you're flooded. And until you're calm enough and your heart rate's down enough, you're not going to be able to have a productive conversation. And when you do have a productive conversation, Sue Johnson would say, try to get to the underlying basic emotional cause for the disruption. How does what we're fighting about represent a threat to our attachment? Sometimes it's harder to see than others. Sometimes it's relatively easy to see, like an affair, for example, an act of infidelity or active mistrust. Um, it's an obvious threat to um, my security. But others are maybe not so, so obvious. Uh, Johnson calls this the protest polka, 
of criticism and withdrawal. And instead, we want to replace it with open, vulnerable, and empathetic dialogue, which you can't do when you're feeling a lot of emotion. As I often say to couples, it's important to talk about emotion in relationships. And sometimes it's dangerous to talk about it when you're experiencing the emotion. All right. So in summary, remember the perpetual issue concept. Remember, I started with that. All relationships have unresolvable issues, so don't push the panic button about that. You can be happy and still have those issues. Relationships require ongoing care and feeding. And if you do that, you'll be way more effective in managing differences. And hopefully, that ongoing care and feeding is a happy um, endeavor for you. Hopefully, it brings you as much reward uh, as, as uh, pain. Um, I always ask the question to couples, is what's required of you to make this relationship work good for you? And the answer to that question should always be yes. And finally, try to look at some things that happen through the attachment lens that complaints can be important. So if you have a complaining spouse, you should be happy about that, <laughs> in some ways at least. Um, uh, in fact, Sue Johnson says when spouses stop, uh, when a, uh, anxiously attached spouses stop complaining, that's often the beginning of the end of the relationship, um, when the complaining spouse just gives up. Okay. So here are the resources I promised. Uh, these two books, I think, are the best of Gottman. Um, he's also out on the internet in uh, YouTube videos, et cetera, et cetera. He's got a website. Susan Johnson, same thing. Um, Esther Perel uh, has that book, Mating in Cap Captivity. She just wrote a new book um, about affairs. Uh, she has a TED Talk about affairs as well. Um, that's quite good. And if that's going on for you, I would very much look at her stuff um, to help you because we definitely don't think that the presence of an infid act of infidelity or even acts of infidelity should mean that your relationship absolutely has to end. All right. Wow. 12.50. I timed that pretty well. So let's go to, so we're, uh, we're going to take some questions. Um, and so send your questions in. I'm going to see if I can get to them. I don't see any. Are there any questions, Brenda? I don't see that we have any questions at this time. All right. Well, uh, let's let's see if we get some. I uh, actually, I think I see I see a couple now. But this is always a problem for me with this. Uh, I can't always see these questions. Can you read them to me? Absolutely. Okay. Here is the first question. Um, how can I handle being the only one to make an attempt at resolving the conflict after the cool-off period? Yeah, well, that's a common question. Um, you know, what if uh, what if you're you're uh, open to um, resolving the conflict? You've you've attended this class. You've read the books. <laughs> uh, you know what to do. But the uh, the um, uh, your partner is is not receptive. Um, I, what I te tell couples, I mean, in some ways, that's if your partner isn't receptive at some point, um, you know, it's not going to end well. But I think you should stick to your guns. I think uh, be the best person that you can be. You know, commit to your own behavior rather than and and uh, or the term uh, the Buddhists use, attach, be attached. To your your effort and your intentions, don't be attached to the outcome. And the more you do that, the more your partner has less to push back against. Because at a minimum, you're giving your partner not very much to push back against. You know, like I'm sorry I did that. Yeah, well, you should be. You know, how much further can it go? Um, you know, uh, so whereas if you're uh, giving and taking uh, criticisms and defensiveness, conversations tend to escalate. Um, so I would say stick with it. Um, and maybe in a calmer moment, try to talk to your partner about what you're trying to do. 
Under no circumstances should you use comparisons. They drive me crazy in my office because they never work, and yet we all do it, which is we say things like, why did you do that? I would never do that to you. Or why did you do this one thing? I do all of these other things, which are the complete opposite. Uh, if anybody has seen that work, I would love to get an email from you and tell me how it worked because it's not effective. But I forgive you for doing it because we all do it. Okay. Um, other questions? Yes. Uh, the next question is, um, is the six-hour formula outlined in Gottman's second book, or is there a TED Talk or web-based source for learning more about that? Uh, the web-based search is where I got the handout. If you look at your... Uh, your go-to webinar here, you'll see a handout. Um, and Brenda has sent that to you. And that lays out the six-hour formula. I think the five hours was in uh, the Seven Principles book. And I don't believe, I have the uh, What Makes Love Last book out on my, uh, so I'll look for it while we're, while we're talking. Um, but yes, uh, the, you could probably find other references for it. Uh, on the internet, um, but it's a pretty simple uh, concept, really, if you look at it. Um, so, okay, what's the next question? Uh, that's all the questions we have right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, it looks like the six hours is not in uh, the What Makes Love Last book. He does have the um, State of the Union meeting in that book. Um, so you'll have to rely on the handout I gave you and look for other resources on the on the internet. Uh, also, one thing neat about Godman is, you know, he's based in Seattle. Um, he's a big shot now, as you might imagine. Um, but his group does two-day seminars in Seattle. And they're not that expensive. And they're not that risky. You know, it's not like an encounter group. Uh, it's more of a lecture format. So if you and your partner wanted to spend a weekend in Seattle, go online and look for when their next Seattle classes are and go spend a couple days there. And um, what the, their format is that they lecture and then they send you off as a couple to work on something for a little while and then you come back and they lecture some more. So it's very safe and, uh, um, and, and friendly. And you get to, you know, the bonus of spending a weekend together. Uh, do we have get any other questions while I was? We have a few. Yeah, we have a few more questions. Um, what does it say about my partner if I'm the only one to ever offer an apology and take accountability for my part and be willingly, and he willingly accepts but never offers his own? Um. Well, the 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 uh, feedback I gave earlier still applies for sure. Um, you know, st stick with your guns. I have had that happen. Um, so, you know, I, I, what we didn't talk about today at all was childhood background. You know, trauma. You know, different things. There are lots of reasons why people might not uh, offer an apology. Uh, they might feel sorry underneath, but for whatever reason, they just don't function like that. I would put that in the box of a perpetual issue, one that you have to learn to live with. Um, and what we do with perpetual issues is we try to minimize their impact. So by building up the positive aspects of a relationship, you then minimize the others. Um, so hopefully your partner shows that he's learning in some way, uh, so he may not apologize and may not take accountability, but hopefully you see a change in behavior or you're getting more of what you want. And I think that's maybe another way that you could go is um, ask for a conversation to talk about what you want that you're not getting um, rather than focus on the fact that he is not apologizing. Sometimes not apologizing too is that um, uh, the inability to accept influence issue, this kind of male thing, um, you know, that that we do, um, uh, where we uh, 
we think that we have to be right all the time or we're we're in charge or um, and so we're not good at being vulnerable um, so it'd be nice if he went to a men's retreat or uh, <laughs> or something like that if that's the problem but uh, getting on his case about it most likely is not gonna gonna get you anywhere all right uh, anything else what else we got you said we had more oh, that's one more that was the one more. That oh, okay. It. Okay. I also I saw. Okay. Good. All right. Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, at least learned something. Looks like we did have a couple of comments now that I'm looking at them where just a couple where people were having trouble hearing me. Um, hopefully that wasn't most of you. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, uh, we're, we're going to end now. And if you have any uh, more questions, feel free to send them to us. Um, and I hope that you'll take advantage of the EAP. Oh, yeah, we didn't get to the last slide. <laughs> Somebody pointed that out. <laughs> I got so excited. Uh, the last slide was, um, hang on. Uh, ah, how do I go to the last slide? Um, all right, we're going to go all the way to the last slide, which talks about the EAP. So that's where I'm going to leave you all, is using your EAP. So the EAP does face-to-face -face counseling, including couples counseling, and going early and often for your couples issues will keep you out of the Roach Motel. Trust me. Too many couples come when it's already too late, and that's the problem. Um, if you come when you still love each other, and you're having some issues and you want to change that, uh, couples therapy can be super effective. And if your partner won't go, I encourage you to go on your own. Okay, and the EAP is there for you, completely free, easy to access by calling our phone number. Okay, thanks everybody for attending. I hope you have a good rest of your week.